For those who are watching on the streaming, um, we are at the Aspen Ideas Festival. The weather is not so friendly. Um, it's raining, actually, um, and it's freezing. But other than that, <laughs> we're happy to be in Aspen, which is usually sunny, except when I show up. Uh, so today, we're going to have a very interesting conversation with Moises Naim uh, about his new book on the revenge of power. Let me briefly introduce him, and then I'm going to ask each of you, or all of you, a question. But to give you an introduction about Moises, um, he um, is one of the great foreign policy intellectuals of, of the Western world. He's born in Libya. At the age of two, came to Venezuela, uh, educated at MIT, where he got his PhD. He uh, was a person who uh, has been for 14 years with the editor of Foreign Policy magazine. After he returned to Venezuela uh, with his PhD from MIT, and he was in the government of uh, Venezuela until um, Mr. Chavez took over and uh, didn't think that Moises was maybe the right person to serve in the government of Venezuela. So Moises has been a, a scholar at the Carnegie uh, Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C., where he lives. He also has a TV show that goes throughout Latin America. He's a columnist. Um, and is well known in the foreign policy circles for his views about um, Latin America, but also all over the world. So I've known him for a long time. He's also a person who created the Group of 50, which is more or less 50 of the leading figures in Latin America and Central America, and they come together regularly to talk about policy issues. So before we get into your background and your views on foreign policy, how many people here um, think the U.S. foreign policy in the Ukraine is, is doing well? Okay. How many people think our policy in China is doing well, our relations with China are doing well? Okay. How many people here uh, think that um, the, policy, the foreign policy of the United States is in better shape than it was under President Trump? Okay. How many people here think the biggest danger to the United States foreign policy, to our national security, is Russia, China, internal, the Congress of the United States? Okay. 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 So um, explain to me why somebody who's born in Libya would want to go to Venezuela. Not that Venezuela is not a great place, but uh, why, you know, what were you doing being born in L Libya anyway? A Jewish well, family, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, that was one of the reasons why we were leaving. But uh, surprisingly, I was not given the chance of uh, have an opinion. I was two years two years old. So, the, yeah, so okay. I didn't, you know, and I were the not, Jews all chased out of Libya? Yeah, yeah and uh, in different ways. But yeah, Libya had uh, at some point a, a very important Jewish community that is now down to zero, um, less than zero, probably. But okay. So uh, why did your family move to Venezuela? Why not go to the United States? My father had a, a, a friend uh, who was uh, an engineer. And uh, his company had been uh, selected to buy a port in the middle of the, of the jungle in Guayana. And his friend uh, persuaded him that this was a wonderful country. And indeed, it, it is a wonderful country. We have very deep, deep uh, feelings for Venezuela. Okay, so you grew up there, mm. and you were a fluent Spanish speaker, I assume. In Venezuela, I speak Spanish, yes. And um, so what made you want to go to MIT? Not that it's not a good they school. They accepted me. They accepted you, didn't you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And what did you study there? Well, I did a bunch of things. Uh, my, my dissertation was about the political economy of multinational corporations. So I was very interested in international financial flows. I was very interested in, in the way different countries related to large corporations. Okay. And uh, why did you go back to Venezuela? Because I felt deep attachment. Okay. Uh, to like, Venezuela. So, all right. So, yeah. and did you, uh, Mr. Chavez, personally throw you out of the government, or you just quit? No, I. Uh, it is a more complicated story. Uh, I was uh, uh, the minister of uh, uh, Fomento, it was called, which is the minister of development, fomenting. And uh, trade and prices and controls were all part of that. And when I was in government, we essentially took them out. And uh, then I, I went, uh, I, I was in the board of directors of the World Bank. And that's where Mr. Chavez okay. had made a uh, coup attempt. So if you went back to Venezuela today, would you be arrested? Well, it, it's uncertain. I don't know that I'll be safe. 
so you're not going back anytime soon. My friends that know about these things uh, say yeah. that it's probably not healthy. I could get in, it's not clear that I could get out, or in what shape would I get out? <laughs> okay, so you're not going back anytime soon. Not for now. Okay. So let's talk about, before we get into Latin America, which is an area that you know extremely well, let's talk about some other areas in the, uh, Ukraine. Um, do you think the United States government should have done more to prevent the invasion by Russia, or was there nothing we could have done more? Uh, you know, passing judgment in those things is, is so complicated. I believe that the United States has done as well as it could be and it was expected. Can, do we have a list of things that uh, he sh it should... Biden and its team should have done differently, of course. The list is long and we know it. But uh, my experience in government told, gave me this instinct of uh, understanding how hard it is to, um, to, to, do, to get things done and to especially to avoid uh, self goals and self, uh, you know, it's very easy to screw it up. And so as long as they don't screw it up, I am happy. So have you ever met Mr. Putin? Yes, as a part of a group in, yeah, in, in one of the meetings. And you think he's, you look into his soul and you see? <laughs> no, he was very strange. He was, uh, there, there is an anecdote. Uh, uh, one of the reporters there, uh, um, journalists, asked him a question, a very benevolent question that he didn't like. And so in, and he started, he was in, you know, in silence for a, a few seconds that felt like an eternity, and then he's, he started asking, this guy had a ring, there was a very big ring, and said, Putin concentrated on that. And I said, why do you need that ring? What are you hiding? Why, why do you need the ring to, it was completely crazy, but it was obvious, an obvious attempt, it was a KGB technique oh. of centering, uh, oh. and, and uncom you know, distracting from an, an uncomfortable question, to, 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 to try to water it down. Have you ever heard the story where Bob Kraft showed him his Super Bowl ring and he put it in his pocket and, and took never, it? And never, never gave it. it back. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. It's like uh, the, Ukraine. The, the, that doesn't okay. didn't happen here. So in the end, um, is there any resolution that is real, uh, likely to happen with Ukraine in the next six months or so? And can it possibly be the case you can actually have a peace agreement as opposed to a truce? Nobody knows. Uh, including uh, the, the leaders of those two countries. I believe that there is a, the, the scenario where this becomes a forever war is a, is, is, has a significant probability in which you have a low intensity kind of armed conflict, more or less permanently. Uh, not unlike what they had before. Uh, but the notion that at some point the Russians uh, are going to collapse and the Ukrainians are going right. to, you know, that scenario is looking iffy. Okay. Let me ask you about uh, China. U.S. relationship with China doesn't seem to be in great shape at the moment. Um, do you see any improvement likely before the next presidential election or anything like that? What we're going to see is a pendulum between the two letters, and I will explain the letters so, uh, now. Uh, when Wendy Sherman, the, the deputy uh, secretary of state, went to China, the, her counterpart in the visit gave her a letter. The letter has a long list of uh, disagreements, uh, conflicts, uh, and um, misunderstandings and, and, uh, in areas of clear conflict. But there is a lo another letter that is the list of things in which the two countries are condemned to collaborate that is in the national interest of China to work with the United States and vice versa. So you have these two letters that it is the way of explaining that you have collaboration and conflict, and what you are going to see is uh, the pendulum going back and forth right. between the Do two. Do you think it's likely that China will invade Taiwan the next two or three years? I have no idea. Well, just guess. <laughs> Most people in Washington don't know what they're yeah. saying either, so, so just guess. Do you think it's likely? Is, the, the, the possibility is always there. Uh, what, what are the probabilities of that possibility? Okay. You know, I, I don't know. So um, let's talk about your new book, The Revenge of Power. And um, the, the essence of your thesis is that people increasingly are getting elected democratically, and then they kind of like being in power, so they kind of adopt the techniques of autocrats, and they don't want to leave power. Um, do you have anybody in mind in the United States that <laughs> you thought might fill that bill? Donald Trump is uh, perfectly fits. The, the book talks about uh, what I call the three Ps, populism, polarization, and post-truth. 
And those are the strategies that are being increasingly used by autocrats who gain power and retain it in a very stealthy way. The essence of the story is of stealthiness. We used to have coup d'etats in which you have a general with dark glasses that said, you know, went to, on television and said, I'm running things here, I am it. What is it with the dark that glasses? No longer, that no longer happens. Uh, now, instead of being an event that is a coup, is a process in which democracy is being undermined from within. Why do people have those dark glasses, all those generals that do that? Oh, they're, they're hiding behind them. Yeah. Okay. So um, right now, your view is that people like to get power, and when they get it, let's say democratically, and even Hitler was elected democratically, you could argue, um, they tend to not want to give up power. Uh, why is that? Is just having power so much fun? Well, there are two, two reasons. One is, is they like it, and second, for increasingly, for these autocrats, it becomes dangerous not to be in power. One of the problems with Putin is that um, he, you know, he has nowhere to go. He either ends in the in the tribunal in the Hague for criminal, uh, for for for, for well, all of the misdeeds, or right. you know, or, or Nicolas Maduro in Venezuela. You know, if he leaves the if he leaves power, there's you know, he will end up in jail or worse. Right, and, and so that that puts you know that that makes him very stable yeah, because uh, you if you're afraid that if you've done something wrong somebody will come after you and indict you or put you in jail after you've left power, so yeah. you don't want to leave power. Speaking of Latin America for a moment, uh, what about Brazil? It seems as if there's a Donald Trump figure who's running Brazil. Uh, do you think the elections there are likely to be as honest as the ones we had here, or maybe not? One of the surprises in Latin America is that uh, elections so far in this new wave uh, in the last 10 years or so, the transfer of power has been um, not conflictive. There was not a, you know, we, we did, in Latin America you would not find the kinds of issues you have seen with uh, Trump. You know, people complain and deny and, and you know, then about the, the elections, but the transfer of power exists. Um, and in Brazil too. Brazil, after India, Brazil is the largest uh, democracy in the world. And uh, they have a very sophisticated uh, electoral, you know, the electoral infrastructure of uh, Brazil is much better than the United States today. Uh, in, the, in the United States, you know, we have the, these whole issues about uh, conditions that limit uh, well, people to... Okay, so you don't, you don't think the military will get in the middle of that election? We have not seen that uh, uh, since uh, for, for right. about... Uh, the, in Venezuela, three, three after Chavez died, and why did, by the way, Chavez, why did he go to Cuba for medical treatment? Why didn't he come to... You know, Mount Sinai or somewhere. Because what people don't understand, uh, and he was offered that, he was offered to go to some of the best hospitals, even to, uh, at that time, Lula da Silva and Dilma Rousseff were running uh, Brazil, and they were very close, and they invited him to go uh, get treatment, but he went to Cuba. And that helps explain, uh, is one more example that Venezuela is a tragedy, is the collapse of, the, of this country is uh, not well understood. And one of the reasons it's not well understood is because people don't pay, have not paid attention to the fact that the Cubans and the Cuban government have been uh, very influential. Venezuela is an occupied nation, occupied by a, by a superpower that is Cuba. Surprise, surprise. But very few decisions in Venezuela today are made in terms of public policy in which the Cubans are not the driving force or have veto power. So and, and so the going, to, and the Cubans told him not to, that for security reasons, he, the only place where he could go safely and have the treatment was Cuba. Did you ever meet Castro? Yes. Was he a smart person? Very, very interesting. He's a nurse. All these people, all these guys are narcissists. And, uh, and some of them are, you know, extreme narcissists. You know, they, they speak and they don't let anybody else speak. Uh, well, but they're, a, they're very seductive, you know, there's a... Well, he made a number of four-hour speeches, so... No, th those are normal. They're, they're well, when you have a meeting with him, does he talk for four hours yes. before you, you yes. can talk, or...? Yes, he... he but, but at the same time that he speaks uh, endlessly, he's, he's a seducer. He wants you to like him. Uh, and okay. he, he goes out of the way and he surprises you, he brings something okay. that is close to your heart and things like that. So let's talk about the Middle East for a moment. Uh, President Biden is probably going to go to Saudi Arabia. Uh, what do you think he's going to be saying to MBS? Uh, all of the, of the a superpower is a hotbed of contradictions because you have so many competing interests, so many competing uh, 
objectives that inevitably you end up contradicting yourself and doing things that are very contradictory. So he inevitably is going to talk about two important things, energy and human rights. And, uh, and, and that uh, is going to be part of one of the greatest challenges we have in the world today is how should a democracy deal with a country that tortures people? Okay. that violates human rights. How do you, do you break relationship? Do you work with it? Do you ignore it? Do you support it? That dilemma is not so obvious. You know, the right. notion that, you know, you of course should not deal with Saudi Arabia because they, uh, right. uh, you know, tortured and killed and uh, a, a journalist. So, uh, it, it, that's not that simple. At the same time, it's not that simple to say, you know, we should ignore any other concern other than the, I right. immediate energy and economic interest. So uh, you're Jewish. I am. I'm Jewish. Uh, why is it that a Jewish state, Israel, has a hard time with so many smart people in there getting a government that can actually work? Because you'd think they would figure out they're very smart. Why can't they get a government that can actually be in existence for a while and be in working? Before, uh, 10 years ago, I wrote a book titled The End of Power that examined the forces that fragmented power. And it argued that increasingly around the world, power had become easier to acquire, harder to use, easier to lose. It was more uh, transient. And uh, they, 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 these kinds of factors that drove uh, the limitations. So, of course, Xi Jinping and, and Vladimir Putin are very powerful, but they are also have more constraints now than in the past. And what happened in Israel, like in other parts, is the same. You know, the, all these forces that fragment power, that force them, you know, they're going to have another election now. And that is because in the United States, you also see the constraints right. on, 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 on presidential power. And so that's a trend that is with us, but coexists with the trends that I described right. in that book which is the trends to concentrate power. So we have the forces that spread and uh, power and the forces that uh, concentrate it and the clash between those, these two explain a lot of what's going on. So the sun never sets on an Israeli election. There's always an Israeli election going but on. But it's not just Israel. In Spain is the same thing. Italy is the same thing. It's, you know, it's becoming a global trend. And together with gridlock, with, you know, Countries are finding that important decisions for their long-term welfare are being blocked by the fact that everybody has a veto power, but no one has enough power to put together an agenda and move it forward. So if you, you're a US citizen. I am. So if you were appointed Secretary of State, what would be your highest priority? What do you think is the most important thing to do? As I, well, uh, as I said, uh, a superpower is not allowed to have one priority. Uh, you're not allowed because the world will take care of letting you know that the priority you picked was not enough, that there's another thing that w will wake you up at 3 a.m. So you will always have a list of emergencies and the most important challenge is to make the U.S. more, um, the expectations about the, United, uh, the, about the United States in the world uh, were deeply damaged in the, during the Trump administration. In your observation, and so that needs to change. In your observation, people know, need to know what to expect, and that is not the case now. In your observation of American foreign policy, who is our best Secretary of State in your lifetime? That's unfair. <laughs> because we had so many good ones, or that's even more unfair. That's right. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, all right, let me, so let me ask you another unfair question. Of all the foreign leaders you've met in the years, who is the single most impressive foreign leader you ever met? I have two, uh, Mandela and Lee Kuan Yew. And I know that Lee Kuan Yew was an autocrat, uh, a benevolent one that was, uh, you know, very good for his country. He created, you know, Singapore was a rock. <laughs> near Malaysia, right? Uh, and he made it the superpower that it, uh, that it is, but he, he governed with a strong, you, you probably you met it, him, right. you met him too. So yeah, I admire Lee Kuan Yew even though he's an autocrat, and uh, Mandela is, was impossible, you know, when, you know, if I had experienced what he had experienced, I don't have it in my soul to be as tolerant and benevolent and open, it, open to dialogue, and, and he, saved South Africa from having a, a, a tragedy, uh, a, a, you know, in terms of uh, So did you meet Mandela? Clashing. Did you ever meet Mandela? Yes. Okay. I met him uh, a few times, and uh, I wasn't intimate of him, but 
I was always amazed. He was in prison for 27 years. And he, 27 years. And he comes out, and what's the first thing he wants to do? Get divorced. <laughs> okay. 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 So anyway. Um, How do you know that his wife was not the one that initiated the divorce decision? Um, he told me. No, no. <laughs> so you never know. Um, but uh, okay. So let me ask you this. In terms of uh, the U.S. foreign policy today, do you think our foreign policy decision process is working reasonably well? National Security Advisor, Secretary of State are working together well. And do you think uh, the President is, because he was Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee for a while and also Vice President, he's on top of all this? I do believe that the foreign policy team uh, that Biden has put together is better than the one that Donald Trump had. Is that a tough statement for you to make? Or? It's a fact, actually. Right, okay. well, you didn't have to think too much about that one. <laughs> but you would be surprised how many people think that, uh, you know, you saw it in the, in, the, in the show of hands here. There are people that believe that Donald Trump did, was very good for the United States and its interests. Well, Donald Trump. Ask that again to see yeah. what well, they get. Okay, so how many people here think the foreign policy of Donald Trump was better than the foreign policy of Joe Biden? Anybody? How many? How many think the Biden foreign policy is better? How many think the Jimmy Carter foreign policy was the best? <laughs> okay. you, you, you work for him. I work for him, so of course it was the best. All right. Um, all right, so you know Henry Kissinger, right? I do. And how has he managed, he's a very smart person, I do know him a bit. Uh, uh, how has he managed to stay in power, not in power, but be so powerful 45 years after he left government. What's the strength uh, that he brings to the table? He's 99 years old, and people are still calling him for, calling him up for opinions. It, ideas. I think he illustrates the power of ideas. People call him not because he's powerful, not because he's on the, on the, on the phone with uh, global leaders, that he's consulted by global leaders and, and captains of industry, but he has ideas. You may not like the ideas, but uh, he's an ideas-driven leader. Uh, the many others are, you know, he of course covets power and was a very powerful right. uh, individual, continues to be, but I think uh, he's an intellectual, right. first and foremost. Since World War II, what is the worst foreign policy decision the United States has made? Uh, not paying enough attention to Latin America. Really? Yeah. That's the worst? Well. What about you, our Vietnam and Iraq? I thought that you'd, you'd those go without. Okay, all right, so that was the worst. Do, right? do we need to talk about right. Vietnam and okay. Af okay. Afghanistan? All right, so since the Marshall Plan was announced, since that, don't count the Marshall Plan, what's the best foreign policy decision the United States has ever made? Oh, I think the way they managed, the United States managed the transition uh, from the Soviet the implosion to, to the next uh, stage. Uh, was very good. I, I recognize that there are all the dilemmas about NATO enlargement and Russia and all that, but uh, I think that the transition, the, you know, winning uh, the, the, the conflict uh, with, uh, with, with the Soviet Union and the implosion of the Soviet Union is, is, a, is a credit to the, to the United States government. Okay, and so uh, today, after the, we have a truce or whatever we have in uh, in Ukraine, do you expect that NATO will stay as strong and as united, and the EU as strong as united as they are now, or will they go back to their? That's old a ways? great question. Uh, so I have been keep saying that uh, Europe discovered one of the. There are some in the mid, in the middle of the, in the midst of the tragedy that is Ukraine, and the horrible, horrible stories that we get every day. There is a silver lining, and that is that that war. Uh, led uh, um, the, the Europeans to discover that they were a superpower, but they didn't know. Uh, they discovered that uh, unity is a superpower, that if they stop uh, the speeches and the bureaucratic the declaration and do just get things done and work together in concert, they are a superpower, they are a player. They were not that before Ukraine. And so that's a, that's a good news. Now, most people in Latin America, now there's a lot of people there, but if you were to summarize, what do they really think of the United States? They're, well, they're, they're still the same thing. You know, they're disappointed and they badmouth the United States, but they are dying for a visa. Uh, at the same time, you know, the, the whole notion that in the morning you 
you go stand in line to get a visa to the United States, and in the afternoon, you go and throw rocks at the embassy. So um, who is the most popular president in world, since World War II, American president in Latin America? Was it John Kennedy? Or? Probably John Kennedy and the Alliance of Progress, which is his initiative that he... All right. And, you know, and, and, and Bill Clinton with the, not throughout Latin America, but, you know, the, the, agree, the trade agreement with Mexico is a very important. But remember, Jimmy Carter gave the Panama Canal back, so don't they like him? <laughs> they don't like him? Okay. So what about our southern border? We seem to have a very uh, porous border. Do you think the fence was a good idea? To no. No, the, the, the fence is a legacy of, uh, I, I, I often talk about uh, political necrophilia. Necrophilia, as you know, is this uh, perversion uh, that some men have. They have a, a, a very strong uh, attraction to cadavers. There oh, is a, a political version of that. I don't want to get that. into that whole subject. That's, uh, that's okay. I, uh, let, okay. Let me finish. No, there is the point in which you know you have these leaders that are enamored, that are, are very attracted to bad policies, with okay. quite failed policies, and that's necrophilia politics. Political necrophilia. Yeah, okay. We're going to kind of keep this clean because. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so do you see any way that we can stop, forget the border wall, stop people from coming from Central America, Latin America, uh, into the United States? Sensibly? There are no, no, and it's not just here. You can look, see that in Europe, you know, the whole thing of migration flows of refugees and all that. And that is going to become even worse with climate change. The main driver of refugees in the next coming years is going to be. Uh, climate change. And, and so uh, what to do and how to handle refugees and people and migrants, illegal or not, uh, is one of the main issues for which there is not a, a silver bullet. There is not a, a one-liner that says, you know, the, the obvious thing that needs to be done and there is no debate about how correct it is, but it doesn't happen, is to create better living conditions in Central America. Now, you live in Washington, D.C., and you're an expert in foreign policy. Do you ever meet with members of Congress? <laughs> yes. Is, is that an uplifting experience? <laughs> uh, some, actually, I want to say that some of them are very competent and, and very well, good. What about yeah. the others? <laughs> <laughs> the others is the majority. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, do you think the Congress really can make foreign policy when they do their hearings, or do you think that... They can mobilize. Uh, I think they can play an important role in energizing and, and, and pushing forward uh, areas. But for that, you need something you don't have, which is uh, a, a shared vision and, uh, a, a, you know, not to have this polarization that is so deep and so paralyzing. Are you worried about a nuclear bomb of course. coming into the United States and so forth? Or? Well, I think in the previous panel, uh, there was a comment that the main threat, uh, uh, the nuclear threat, is not big bombs from big power, superpowers, but uh, smaller bombs that fall in the wrong hands. What about cyber? Are you, is that a big threat to us? So cyber is surprising, right? Because we were all expect, expecting a massive uh, uh, attack or cyber attack on Ukraine and its allies uh, coming from uh, Russia. Well, Russia has been a player in, in cyber for now, uh, for decades. Uh, and it didn't happen. And so, you know, there are very, is it, it, there are very interesting reasons why uh, Russia did not perform in terms of uh, staging a, a what about the Mr. Zelensky? Have you met him? No. And do you think he's done a good job? He's an accidental hero. Um, and, and that's the way you need to think about it. Uh, and he is, he's, he's being heroic. Uh, he's being um, excellent. And he's a model for the rest of the world. I think he moved his country and the whole situation with Russia in ways that uh, are admirable. What about Iran? Do you see that Iran is inevitably moving towards creating a, uh, getting a nuclear bomb and there's no chance of stopping that? I, I, am, I want to believe that there's still a chance, that there's still more, more important. I think the Iran deal that Trump uh, uh, left was, um, that leaving that, that, that deal uh, was a big mistake and I, I still hope that the deal can go forward. So um, President Trump and his team, did they ever consult you on foreign policy matters or ask for your advice? Not that I recall, no. Not that you ever recall, okay. <laughs> and okay, so today, um, in your book, if somebody says, I, I don't have time to read this book, I'd like to read it, but I don't have time, what would be the essence of it? Could you summarize it in like a paragraph? I think you, <laughs> you did a good job at the beginning of explaining it. Uh, 
one of the things that happened in the last decade is the world changed in very profound ways and you know climate change and it, 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 it accelerated plus you, you know the list we have pandemics and we have the financial crisis and, and all of that the other thing that happened in the last decade that, that people don't talk about too much is uh, the, the democracy went down around the world. The number of people that live in democratic uh, regimes um, uh, has grown. It, when I wrote The End of Power, it was 40% of humanity lived in, uh, in, in, in autocracies, and now it's 70%. Uh, and, and the decline of democracy the, 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 is, is very grave. And so this book is an attempt to to explain how these uh, autocrats have stealthily uh, made democracy an endangered species. Now, your, first, your previous book was called The End of Power. This is The Revenge of Power. Will the next one be The Something Else of Power? Do you like the, that title? You seem to have something of power all the time. Well, what have you has, thought about has, your next book yet? Yes, I am writing one, but I, I am is not ready to be debated. I am okay. still confused about it. So if you had to do it all over again, would you go into foreign policy or private equity? <laughs> uh, I, I would be, I, I will continue to be, my passion is writing and really? that's what I do and that, I, I think it makes me happier to be right, but, alone writing in my private room. private equity, you make companies better. And but, I, but I would be talking to people like yeah, you all okay, the time. Right. For example, I, tell, I, I would be remiss and, and, and they would be right to, to tell me that I lost an opportunity. Uh, what are you doing with your money these days? What am I doing with my money? <laughs> well, paying a lot of taxes, actually. Um, but um, actually, I did sign, I'm an original signer of the Giving Pledge, and I actually committed to give away the bulk of my money, so I'm in the process of doing that through various philanthropic things. But, uh, and then I try to give do things in cultural areas and give back to the country, so I, I am involved in a lot of philanthropic things. But uh, what are you doing with your money? No, no, but you haven't said how you make it. How do I? I you, we got it that you're spending it in philanthropy. Right. We, right. we know okay. and we admire you right. and grateful for that. But explain, so that's the, 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 how you get out of having so much money. But how do you stop making, you know, you, what are you doing with the income part of that story? How do you stop making it? Or no, how, how do, do you, you make what, it? What are you doing to make money? Make, okay. Well, obviously the country is now in a, slow economic growth period of time. You could argue it's a recession, you could argue it's something else. But I would say that now is probably a reasonably good time to invest because prices, you never know when the, you're gonna hit rock bottom. If you wait for rock bottom or you wait for the top of the market, it's not generally a, a, a good thing to do. And most, the biggest mistake that investors make is they see the market going up and they jump in. Or they see the market going down and they get out. That's usually the worst thing. When the markets are going down, you should look for some things that are probably going to be priced low, and then you can probably get a discount. So today, I am uh, investing in a lot of things that I think are, have, prices have come down and, um, and are likely to bounce up back again. But I obviously see that in the technology world, the prices have been dramatically going down. So I think these companies are probably still pretty good companies. Some of them are maybe overvalued, but I, I think there's probably still pretty good opportunities to invest. So. Um, and I think investing is, uh, you know, right now the stock market probably hasn't hit bottom. It may go down a bit, it'll, it'll gyrate for a while. But I, I, I don't think we're in a, uh, uh, anything like the last uh, uh, great recession uh, that we had. So I don't think it's uh, quite that bad. And I remind some of you, maybe you've heard me tell, say this before, when I worked in the White House for President Carter, he was running for re-election. And um, he... Uh, had an inflation advisor, a very smart man, uh, economist from Cornell, who was supposed to fight inflation and so forth. And he went out a couple times in the press room at the White House and said, I think we're heading into a recession, or we may already be in a recession now. And Carter called him into the Oval Office and said, look, I'm running for re-election. Don't use the R word. It scares people. And the man said, well, look, I'm honest. What do you want me to do? Say the truth, but don't use the R word. It scares people. So he went out the next time and he said, I think we're heading into a banana. <laughs> and he used the word banana because he recognized reporters wouldn't say Carter's inflation advisor thinks we're heading into a banana. And it kind of worked, and I'm thinking about using the same technique myself. But anyway, uh, so let's have some questions from our members. Here, here's a question here. Uh, here's a mic. 
stand up and you can give your name if you want or if you don't want to be anonymous, you don't have to, uh, give your name and just ask one question, not a statement or something. Yes, thank you. Guadalupe Rodriguez, nice to be here, nice to meet you. I'm interested in your perspective on AMLO and where we're going in Mexico. He is one of the most popular presidents in the world. According to surveys, uh, the president of Mexico is, uh, you know, well liked by the Mexicans. But I am convinced that he's a disaster. Uh, he is a, a avid practitioner of political necrophilia. He is deeply, deeply in love with bad ideas that have been tried and tested many times in his countries and other countries. But he continues to be attracted to them, and uh, and, and people like it. Obviously, you know. Um, but let's see how that ends. I don't know that it's going to end well. So you haven't made up your mind on him yet, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay, right here. Uh, is there a mic right here? I guess you're not going to get a visa to Mexico anytime soon. Here's, here's a mic right behind you. Right here. Here, here it is. Or steal it. The, uh, and, but in your book, I didn't get to ask you a question at a previous meeting we had which is you say that the, and I have to state that I am an independent, truly independent, I've voted both sides of the, and, and I, I despise both parties and admire both parties equally. So the, um, in your book you say that the Republican Party is not a party, and you don't explain why not. I, I assume it's because they, there's this falling in love with indivi individual personalities, but I don't know, you should answer it. But you don't say that the Democratic Party is not a party. It is the only party that exists in the United States. Could you clarify that? Yeah, you read a different book. <laughs> I, I never said that. Let, let's, the, the, I'm going to be signing books later. Let, let's, let's look. I, I don't. Then you're saying it is a party. Of course it's a party. Okay. It's, a, you know, it's a party that now has some malignant elements on it. OK. So another question from somebody who's read the book, right? Okay. <laughs> right here, uh, here's one, okay. Yeah, Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, question, I, is it that the Trumps, uh, the Bolsonaros, and the uh, Orbans of the world just happened to come up at the same time, or do you think that it was a coordinated effort to discredit democracy uh, and um, the spheres of influence uh, by you know Russia and China and Latin America and Sub-Saharan Africa and other places, uh, encouraging the undermining of the democratic uh, ideology. I do think there was a, co a, a conspiracy, a theory, you know, the notion that uh, they they got together and decided to take power stealthily and, and do away with democracy. I don't think it happened that way. The main driver uh, of what happened was first discovering how difficult, if not impossible, was to be successful in government these days because of the end of power and the fragmentation and all of that. So it's very hard to be successful. So if you're not successful by your performance and that gives you legitimacy, what do you do? You do the three Ps. You, you, the populism, which is divide and conquer, the polarization, which is fragment and uh, to, uh, as much as you can, and post-truth will make everyone confused about what they have to think and what they're thinking. And they just discovered that the, the, that mix, that recipe uh, worked. And it worked, and they saw how it was working in different uh, nations. So the three Ps, populism, polarization, and post-truth will explain a lot of what happened with democracy during these last 10 years. Okay, there's another question right here. Hi, Osman Ahmed, one in Washington, D.C. Uh, how do we get off this train track if those three Ps are so powerful? And I know there's no silver bullet, but I'm curious if you have recommendations. Yeah, no. Um, so the, the, you, you will never solve a problem that you have not recognized as such. And because these leaders have done it in such a stealthy way, the world is still not recognizing that this is going on. And if you don't think that this is going on, you will not do any, anything about that. So the first, and my attempt in the book is to call attention that this is happening and we need to, uh, uh, to save democracy. I think, I do believe that democracy is, uh, is, is an endangered species. The book has a whole chapter on what to do. Okay, right back here. There's a mic right behind you there. Beto Payares from El Paso, Texas. Uh, is there a policy that would be palatable and actionable to both parties to deal with immigration and the surge of immigration on the border? 
As I said, there is uh, not a silver, there is not a one-liner that can answer that. Uh, uh, but the, the one-liner that everybody agrees that is necessary is to improve living conditions in Central America and beyond. If you don't start with that, nothing will happen because you will continue to have the push of millions uh, that simply can, cannot live in the, in the country. So the first priority is that. And there are ways of doing it, but it ha have not been done yet. What about the rainforest? Is that being decimated now in, in Brazil? No, but it's not doing well. Uh, and again, that's another area where you would expect that the relationship between the United States and Brazil will help contain uh, some you know, desertification and uh, deforestation and all that. Okay, other questions? Uh, right here, back here, there's uh, here and then there. Okay, so just, just one back here and then we'll hear. Hi, so looking at the fall of democracy, I was also wondering what do you think these struggling democracies can learn from the countries that have recently quite successfully transitioned to democracy? Like what comes to mind is Chile going from Pinochet to one of the stronger democracies in the region. What do you think that these struggling democracies can learn? Well, the most important thing is to uh, respect checks and balances. The first thing that these new autocrats do is to stealthily water down, um, you know, and limit and, and weaken checks and balances. And they do it by taking stealth, con stealthy control of, uh, the first thing they do is they, they, uh, they try to control uh, the Supreme Courts and the main tribunals and make sure that they control that and there are different ways of controlling the Supreme Court of a country. Once you have that, you go to Congress and you start buying, cajoling, extorting, extracting uh, support from, uh, uh, from, con you know, from Congress people. Uh, and the third is control the media. And again, the way they do it is stealthily. Urban in, in, uh, is an example of a global trend. In, in, in Hungary, there, were, there is a broad network of uh, regional uh, radio stations and newspapers. Uh, and all of a sudden, they, so, some business people started appearing and buying them at inordinately expensive prices. And, uh, and of course, those are, in, in the past, the government would have censored. It would have sent censors. Now it sent investors that bought the country, that, that bought the, the, the assets, the, the media assets. And immediately, they changed their editorial line in support of the government. That happened in, 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 uh, in Hungary, but it has happened uh, in, in a lot of other countries where you have the three P presidents. Okay, right here. Uh, hi, David Bowen, Washington, DC. So you talked about the stock market going down and then coming down for a bit and then coming back up. And you talked about democracies having uh, declined for a while. How close do you think we are to sort of market rock bottom on that? Um, is it going to come back up, or are we heading for sort of a democratic banana? So, <laughs> go ahead. You want me to talk about money? Well, you, you, I think we're about democracy coming back. <laughs> no, there is. I was telling David before he started that I was keen on mentioning, and thank you because it, this allows. Um, inflation is here. And uh, no, how many people here have lived in high inflation countries? Raise your hands. Very few people. Inflation is not the experience that most uh, of people in developed countries have. Inflation is very insidious, is terrible, is, it creates poverty, inequality, hungers. So inflation is horrible. And once that it gets entrenched and becomes part of contracts and there is all, everything is indexed, because you need to index to protect uh, the value of your asset, then it's become very hard to get rid. Infla once it is entrenched, inflation is very hard to get rid of. And we're going there. Inflation is already here. Is inflation is not going to be short-lived. Inflation is going to be with us. It's going to become part of the ex living experience of millions of people that have never experienced it. And that coincides with a period in which there are many doubts about democracy. People, people are skeptical about democracy. People have lost enthusiasm about democracy. So you have that and you have inflation. And the combination of both may accelerate the demise of democracies in many countries. And that's why I'm saying that democracy is an endangered species in the political habitat of the world. 
So we are out of time. I want to thank Moises for this, and I want to thank all of you. We had a full house. I don't know if it was because of the rain or what, but everybody was here, and uh, I enjoyed hearing your views. Uh, you're going to sign books on the Revenge of Power. For those who are watching online, you can buy it. Is this available on Amazon or something else, yes. or not available? Yes, it's available. Okay. So thank you all very much. Appreciate it.